Hi everybody, my name is Mark and I'm the creator of the NYX Tracker. In this video I'm going to teach you how to make the most of the NYX Tracker. In other words, I'll teach you how to use it and then I'll also give you some tips so that you can really get the most out of it. I also want to try to answer some frequently asked questions that come up, particularly about the laser and, and how that all works. I think a lot of people don't quite understand uh, the features that are unique to the NYX Tracker that I think make it a really, really good tracker, especially for those that are starting out. Okay. So before we get started, and before you get to this point, you will receive a box with your NYX tracker that looks somewhat like this, except with a shipping label on it, of course. Let's go ahead and open it up. These are the aforementioned instructions that I'm just going to set aside from now. I suggest you read those because they're complementary to what I'll say here, but, but basically everything in those instructions I will cover. All right, so you have your NYX tracker like this, and you have a ball head. We'll put the ball head on in just a minute. Let's go through step by step how to set up your NYX tracker. Okay, first open it like a book. You'll notice there's a driving rod here with a large threaded gear on it. Take that driving rod out with the threaded gear and make sh making sure that the hub of the threaded gear is pointed away from the top piece, screw it in. Give it five or six turns. It's not critical how many turns you do, just make sure it's, it's nice and threaded in. Okay. And then at this point, before we close it, uh, it's the best time to put in the batteries. So four AAA batteries, which you just put in right here, just like that. And at this point, it's a good idea to press the laser button, make sure it works, and test the motor, all right? This is also the easiest time to make sure that your speed settings and your northern, uh, southern hemisphere toggle switch is what you want. We're going to be imaging the stars, so I put the dip switch settings and how they need to be, and we're in the northern hemisphere, so the northern sun, southern switch is flipped to the north. Okay. At this point, we're ready to close it up. Now you might have to nudge the driving rod just a little bit and bend it as it goes in, just a, just a little bit, making sure that the hub of the large gear seats in the counterboard hole there. Okay. You also want to make sure that the gear teeth interlock and uh, just as they're supposed to. Okay, great. Last step is we attach the spring to the eye bolt in there. What this does is it provides preload to keep the tracker stable. Next, go ahead and screw on the, tr the uh, ball head. If you have your own ball head, you can put that on there but uh, a ball head does come with every NYX tracker purchase unless specified otherwise. You, you can select that as an option. You don't have to buy a ball head. It gives you a, a little bit of a discount. Okay, so that's how we're set up. Now, just a quick note. The driving rod here will last two hours of imaging if you screw down the gear all the way to the bottom. Now, this is the configuration for the northern hemisphere. Those in the southern hemisphere, you're going to want to start with the gear up at the top. The reason for that is, is if you're in the northern hemisphere, the barn doors close. The barn door closes. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it opens. Okay. And the reason for that is, in the southern hemisphere, uh, people are looking basically instead of the top of the sky, the bottom of the sky, or maybe in their definition, it's the top of the sky. I don't know. But in any case, they're looking at a different region of the sky, and because the Earth rotates in the same direction. If you're looking at the opposite end, it appears as though the stars rotate in the opposite direction. Okay? So, we'll go into that a little bit more with the alignment later on. But that's pretty much how you set up the NYX tracker before you start putting the camera on the tripod. So let's get right to it. Here we have a tripod. This is an Amazon Basics tripod. I would not recommend this. It's like rickety as hell. Not, not the greatest tripod. Okay? If you happen to have a rickety tripod like this, one thing that helps is if you attach a weight, maybe a, a bag of sand or water or weights, whatever you have handy, to the, to the bottom of your uh, tripod center column like this. What that'll do is it'll weight everything down and keep it settled as you're tracking the stars. Otherwise, even the most minimal vibrations, people walking around it, their footsteps, um, wind, anything like that can induce movement into the tripod and your camera. You don't want that, okay? Two keys to good star tracking photography. One is stability. That is number one. You've got to keep things stable. In other words, not moving. Unless they're intended to be moving. 
Number two is alignment. And like I said, we'll get to that in a minute. All right, so let's go ahead and take our, our tracker here and screw it onto our tripod. In the case of this tripod, it's got a removable head, so I'm just going to remove that. And screw it down tight. Okay, hopefully you know generally where in the sky the uh, celestial pole is for your hemisphere. If you're in the north, the celestial pole is going to be um, the Little Dipper's handle, the last star. Okay, that's Polaris. That marks the celestial north pole. It's not exactly on the celestial north pole. It's about a quarter of your pinky uh, from it at arm's length. So that doesn't seem like a lot, but you, if you're doing longer focal lengths or longer uh, exposures, it does matter, and you want to make sure that you align to the north. Excuse me, the celestial pole, exactly on it. The closer, the better. Okay, but for now, if we're just shooting wide field, um, we're just going to aim straight at Polaris. Okay, so if I know where it is, I got to set up the tracker in a basic sense to aim in that direction. So you know what? This doesn't isn't exactly the orientation I want. So let's change up the orientation. Just like that, okay, that's a little better. All right, cool. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my camera on. That's pretty basic here. Just gonna screw it right on, okay. Now at this point, I'm going to point my tracker in the region of the sky where the, the celestial pole is, okay? I'm not going to do any fine alignment right now, but I'll use the laser to get kind of close to Polaris, all right? That's pretty, pretty close, close enough for now. I'm going to tighten everything down, okay? See, we're not right on it, but we're close to it. Now, now's probably a good time to talk about how exactly we're aligning with the laser. This seems to be a question that a lot of people are confused about. So, for most star trackers, what they come with is a, either a scope or a bore sight, kind of like aiming with a firearm if you've ever, if you've ever shot a, a rubber band gun or something like that. You look down the barrel and that's where you're aimed, okay? Now, when I was designing the NYX tracker, I didn't like the fact that most trackers I had used up until that point, I had to get down on my knees, I had to, you know, you know just like, put my neck at weird angles and at the middle of the night when it's cold and you're on concrete or gravel, it's, it's just not very comfortable. So I had seen somebody use a green laser for alignment and it just seemed beautiful because lasers, you just press the button, no, you know, no getting down on my knees, just press the button and you'll see in the night sky these nice bright 5 milliwatt green lasers will look like a lightsaber because they illuminate all the particles in the air. Okay, and so, but how do you align to that? At what point of the laser am I supposed to uh, point to? Or at what point in the laser path is the place that I'm aligned to? Well, that's easy. It's where the laser seems to disappear. It's not that it's disappearing, it's that it's asymptotically approaching that point the farther out you look, okay? So basically, what we've done is we've created a bore sight that is so long because the light just keeps going, is so long that by being only a foot or two away as we're aiming, we're basically looking down the bore sight. So no matter where I walk around the tracker, that laser is going to appear to point to the exact same spot. And that's, that just makes alignment really easy. In other words, where the laser points is where you want to align to. And uh, when you get your tracker, the laser has been uh, adhered to the wood, has been glued in, in a way that it's uh, aligned with the hinge axis of the tracker, so that within about two tenths, three tenths of a degree. So that means that the laser and the hinge axis are pretty much the same, okay? So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. If it's still unclear, you know, shoot me a comment or shoot me an email and I'll, I'll try to explain a little bit better. But get out there in the night and, and test it out, and, and I hope you find that it's as easy to use as, as, I, as I find it. Okay, so back to setting up, all right? So next thing I'm gonna do, now that the tracker is in the vicinity of the celestial pole, 
is I'm going to set my camera to where I want to shoot. Alright, so let's just say I'm going to try to shoot the core of the Milky Way about like right there, alright? Something like that. Um, and at this point, I've set my camera to shoot with raw image, images because I don't want the camera compressing into JPEGs because that introduces all sorts of artifacts. In post-processing, you want raw data. So I've got raw mode set. I'm shooting at 1600 ISO, which I think is a pretty good place to start. And I've set my exposure time according to the uh, exposure table. Okay. Now just a quick note about this. This is a Sony Nex 5T. Not the greatest camera for astrophotography, but it's compact and, and fun. I like it. It's a pretty good camera. Um, problem with it is that it's a crop sensor. I mean, it's not a problem. It's just a consideration. Crop sensors are smaller, and so therefore it's as if you're imaging just a portion of the image coming in from your lens. And what that kind of feels like is that you're zoomed in. In other words, for the lens, focal length, uh, you're going to need to apply a crop factor. For Sony cameras, it's 1.5. For Canon cameras, I believe it's 1.6. For Nikon, I think it's also 1.5. In any case, you have to look it up for your camera. But if this lens here says 19 millimeters, if I'm on a crop sensor, that means the effective focal length, the, the focal length that I need to use to calculate my exposure time, is 1.5 times 19 millimeters. So basically, uh, 30 millimeters, okay? So I look at my exposure table, I look at 30, and it's recommending about 80 seconds exposure. Now when you're first starting out, I would, I would have this, just have it. So I'm going to do a 40 second exposure or so. And the reason for that is you just want to get familiar with how things are working, and you want to get good at aligning. Aligning can be kind of hard. So start easy, and then work your way up, okay? All right, so now that we've got the camera pointed at the region of sky that we want to image and uh, everything else is set up, we want to now do our fine alignment, okay? Now again, uh, you want to make sure you're, you're hitting the uh, celestial pole as closely as possible, but for now, I'm just going to hit Polaris in this wonderfully accurate map of the stars. Um, we're going we're gonna to just hit Polaris, okay? For a focal length, of, an effective focal length of 30 millimeters, you know, it's, it's less important um, to get the alignment right on, especially if you're not uh, pushing your exposure time uh, very, very long, okay? So, who knows we're off, so I'm going to now take the time to find a line, loosen things up. Cool, I think we're there. Now, before, we're, before you finish, you want to do the pinky test, okay? The pinky test is just a light tap. That means when you take it off, the, the tripod and the tracker and the camera are still pointed to where you think they should be, okay? Last step is we press, turn the motor on, make sure it's going, and we start our images. Now, don't, uh, well, I shouldn't say don't, but it's best if you can uh, start your imaging with a remote. Okay, because when we press this, we're going to induce in vibration into the, the whole setup, and we don't want to do that. So maybe put it on a timer or use a remote to start your imaging. Okay, and again, while you're imaging, you don't want to disturb the tripod or the camera or the tracker. You want to make sure that people aren't walking in the close vicinity of it. You want to make sure that it's shielded from the wind as much as possible, and you want to make sure that everything's settled. So, shooting from a building is not a great idea. Buildings sway and move. You might not notice it in your day-to-day, -day, but they do quite significantly. You don't want to set it on grass, which can settle and move. You want to set it on something firm, like a, a stone, like a big rock, or concrete, or something of that nature. Okay? So, I'm not going to go over the the post-processing at all, but once you get your images, you download it to your computer, and then you can start with the whole post-processing journey. That is uh, a skill that you're going to have to take time to develop, but people often use tools such as Deep Sky Stacker, which will stack all your frames and align them. Uh, people often use Photoshop. Uh, those are some of the more budget-conscious options. But then if you are wanting to do more processing, there are programs like PixInsight, which uh, are a bit more expensive. 
In any case, there are lots of options and lots of tutorials and lots of websites out there that will teach you how to get the most out of your data. But the Nix Tracker will help you to get good data in the first place. Okay, so let's just say we're done taking all our pictures and we're good to go. So I'm going to tell you now real quick how to break down the Nix Tracker. Okay, kind of in reverse. I'm just going to take the camera right off. Remove it from the tripod. Okay. Remove it from the tripod. Just like this. I'm going to unhook the spring. Okay. Just like this. All right. And then open it like a book. Unscrew the driving rod. Spin the gear back to about the center position in the driving rod. Now before you clip it to the stowage clip right here, I'm just going to put it in the top piece to make sure it fits correctly. Okay? It looks like I need to screw the large gear down a little bit more so that it will fit correctly in its stowage compartment like that. Okay, and I take it off and I put it in there. Just like that. Close it on up. And your next tracker is good to go.